Senator, thank you so much for sitting down with me. You only have a few months left in this position, so there's not a lot of time to get stuff done, but there are still a host of issues kind of plaguing our country. What are the things you're most worried about? Well, I'd note to begin that a lot of politicians spend their time talking about things that sound good to the folks back home, but have no impact on the future of the country. Well, and you don't we need to do that. I don't need to do that. But the big things that we ought to be dealing with, one, the amount of debt we have. It's getting to be a problem, all right? Number two, the emergence of China as a great power, if not the great power. Three, the climate. We talk about things that make us feel good about ourselves, but won't actually deal with the climate. And the big one, artificial intelligence. AI is um, changing the world. It's as big a disruptor as nuclear power was. Uh, how are we gonna deal with it? These are things we're gonna finally have to get our arms around uh, if we're gonna make sure that the future is as bright for our kids as it has been for us. The only way we do that is to work together. You are leaving Congress along with a number of other colleagues who are known for creating bipartisan solutions. But right now, sort of rising prominent voices, especially on the right, are condemning working together. They mockingly talk about the unit party, but isn't working together what you're supposed to do? Why has it become a bad thing? Well, the, the reality is, given the way that government works, in order for something to become law requires Republicans and Democrats to agree. Yes. All right, that, that's, that's to become law. There are a lot of people who don't want anything to become law. It's like, well, we're not gonna solve the deficit if we don't create law. We're not gonna fix the border if we don't have law. Uh, we're not gonna deal with the emergence of China taking away our jobs. We're not gonna deal with the changes in our climate. All these things have to have people work together. And I know it's nice to go back home and you know, fire up the base and get everybody to say, oh, he's a real fighter. But if that fighter is not willing to actually work with the people across the aisle, that fighter's not gonna get anything done. And there are too many people today who don't recognize we need to do some things right now because not doing something could end up being quite perilous down the road. But a lot of those people, the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene, are rising in power and their brand is do not work together. They wanna fire Mike Johnson over it. Yeah, there's no question. If you wanna run uh, in this country today, you pretty much have to appeal to your base. And the worst thing you could possibly say is, I wanna work on a bipartisan basis. Forget your primary. And in the past, of course, there were a lot of races that were contested between Republicans and Democrats. So you worried about the general election. But today, most people running for office only worry about the primary. I mean, if you go back to 1998, the Cook Report said there were 164 toss-up races in the House. Today, they say there are 23. Basically, that means that the entire House is only focused on their primary. And you don't get primaried from the center you don't have someone say, hey, I'm a good centrist. Why don't you elect? No, no, you get primaried from your wing. If you're a Democrat for the left, Republican from the right. So you have people, if you will, appealing more and more to the base of their respective party, unwilling to tackle the challenges we have. And right now we got some big ones. The debt's a big one. The border is a big one. Uh, we, we're going to have to deal with these issues. But if the border was such a big one, and I don't disagree with you that it is, how come there has been almost no will on the part of Congress since Reagan to get something done in a substantive way? Well, because when you're dealing with a border, you're dealing with a highly emotional, powerful, partisan issue. And so Democrats wanna be as far left as they can be to protect their flank in the primary, and Republicans wanna be as far right as they can be, and anything that sounds like it's a middle ground is gonna be unattracted to the wings. And right now, we got too many people that just think about what's in the wing as opposed to what's right for the entire country and how do you get something done? But not necessarily on top. President Biden ran as a bipartisan president. He's worked with you on a number of things and gotten a lot done. The infrastructure law, the CHIPS Act, lowered uh, health care costs. The list goes on, but the country remains polarized and getting more divided. If he were to have a second term, do you think there is something he could do to actually bring people back together? Because He's got a lot of policies under his belt that he's done for the country and worked with you. Yeah, the way to bring people together is not just to give a good speech, nice as that is. The way to get people together is to tell them the truth, to let them know what the real challenges are that you're concerned about and how you're gonna honestly deal with them. And what we're seeing too often from politicians on the right and the left is appealing to the crowd, 
appealing to the, uh, the least common denominator, the lowest common denominator, as opposed to saying, hey, here's what we have to do if we're going to get the job done, and then being willing to work with people to cross the aisle to do it. And, and that requires maybe a president, either Trump or Biden, who isn't going to run again. This is their last term. But President Biden isn't just giving a good speech. Infrastructure law is now the law. The CHIPS Act is bringing jobs back, is bringing manufacturing yeah, back. No, Those aren't speeches. No, Those are policies. No, there's no question that President Biden accomplished a number of things. But don't forget, in politics, very few people care about what you've done. They care about what you're going to do. All right? And right now, there are a couple of things that are very much on people's minds. Number one, the fact that things cost more than they did before. Inflation is still there. People somehow think that prices are going to go down. No, when you, when you beat deflation. inflation, prices don't go down. That would be deflation. They just stabilize, and they're getting stabilized. But the fact that people are paying more is a real concern to them. And number two, the border. Look, people have been screaming about the border for all three and a half years. Joe Biden has been president, and he has not done anything to solve the problem at the border. That's a huge issue for President Trump. I can't understand why President Biden didn't tackle this from the very beginning. But what has Congress done? Because it's Congress who sets the laws. Well, the Republicans have put forward our plan. Uh, the House put out a, a border plan, and um, that's what Congress did. The president said, no, that wasn't acceptable. Then they began working on a bipartisan basis. But you know what? This was not a problem when President Trump was president. The reality is... The border has been a problem for years, I, sir. I, I and, and a plan was just put together, I, and it was Donald Trump, who's not currently in he, office, who blocked it. Yeah, he, he blocked the plan in part, I'm sure, because he wants to keep this issue hot and alive for his election. But don't forget, when he was president, he did a lot of things that sounded pretty ugly, but we didn't have anywhere near the number of people that have come into the country illegally as we have under President Biden. And that's something he should have done everything in his power. Frankly, take some actions that maybe the courts would have stopped. Then he'd have had a better argument saying, hey, Congress needed to act. But he never did that. And but, as a result, the American people are saying, hey, I want something else. But as you said, it doesn't matter what you did in the past. It matters what happens now. And right now, President Biden, with Congress, put together something, and it was Donald Trump who blocked it. So he can say to the American people, here's what I'm doing now. Yeah, if will, Donald Trump yeah. were to be elected, do you think there's anything he would do to bring people together? Uh, I don't know if that's his ambition, uh, to bring people together. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it is he hopes to do uh, if he gets a second term. Um, maybe in a second term, he'll be thinking less about appealing to the base and maybe actually having a legacy of some kind. I don't know. But as you listen to the campaign so far, it's basically saying, hey, I won in 2020. Uh, and trying which he to get, didn't. Which he didn't. Uh, and trying to get other people to say the same thing. Uh, taking on social issues, cultural issues, and making a big deal of that. Uh, that's kind of what his campaign is focused on. And, of course, the border. That's an issue that's worked for him. It worked for him uh, back in 2016. He expects it'll work for him again. If I were President Biden, I'd be all over that. And instead, he served it to President Trump on a silver platter. But of course now, he is addressing the border and Trump's blocking it. I want to talk about foreign policy because you know a ton about it. There are now are people in your party who are expressing views that would have been unthinkable a few years ago, uh, when you think about support for Ukraine. Um, even the idea that, that people somehow um, have similar views of the likes of Vladimir Putin. What is your take on that? Where did it come from? Yeah, it's disorienting. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, to someone like me, it's, it's unimaginable that in the party of, of uh, Ronald Reagan and George Herbert Walker Bush and George W. Bush and John McCain and others, that, that we would see a growing isolationism uh, within our party. I think it flows in part from talk TV, talk radio, uh, the Tucker Carlson uh, of the world. That, that, Never uh, heard of him. Uh, exactly. That, that say outrageous things and the base says, yeah, ex ex exactly. Uh, and, uh, and so many in our party have followed that uh, populist streak, which is, hey, stop worrying about the rest of the world. Just w worry about what's going on here. What they're forgetting is, that we are connected to the rest of the world, that our economy is connected to the rest of the world, that, that if we'd have had that attitude, then, then you know, Germany would have ended up ruling the world. All right, we're involved in the world out of our own self-interest. You know, I laugh at the phrase America first. I, I know it typically means, oh, isolationism. But really, America is putting ourselves first when we're involved in the world, when we stop bad people. Look, if Vladimir Putin goes not just through Ukraine, but then decides to go into Poland, then we're involved 
in conflict with our sons and daughters going to war. Or we could walk away from NATO, in which case Putin is going to keep on going and going. How about a world where China and Russia control the world and we have our own little island? That's not a world where Americans are going to be safe or prosperous. We're safe and prosperous when the world follows the orders that have existed over the last 75 years with a strong NATO, strong allies, strong friends, and where America stands for something like freedom. President Biden agrees with you on, I think, all of those points. If he were to have a second term, could the thought of Mitt Romney as his secretary of state be a possibility? No. <laughs> very, <laughs> no. Very, he, has, he has plenty of Democrats to choose from uh, and a number of people who uh, believe it's important for us to be involved in the world. But uh, I, I'm not going to be part of the Biden administration, <laughs> that's for sure. I'm a Republican. I'm fundamentally uh, in disagreement with uh, a, a great deal of what President Biden does. Look, the idea of him get, saying, I'm going to forgive all the student loans. I mean, let's give a trillion dollars to college graduates. Look, if he's going to give away a trillion dollars, he should have given it to the poor. But, but the idea that, hey, we're going to... We do, and we have all sorts of corporate bailouts. Think about how much money we've given the airline industry. Think well, about we, TARP. We kept, Think about we, bailing out banks. We, in part because you want to make sure that all the American people have money that they're able to spend. We have banks because that's our whole financial system. People's savings, their earnings come from jobs. So you want to make sure, for instance, that airlines keep flying. If the airlines stop, stop flying, the economy collapses. That's hurt. That hurts everybody. Sure, but if but they're handing seeing... out money, handing out just free cash to college students makes no sense at all. Think of the people who paid their own way to go to college, people who paid back their loans. How is it fair to them? How about someone that didn't go to college? Why, why are you going to give... $40,000 of loan forgiveness to a college grad and someone else who's, let's say, uh, working in, as a welder, they get nothing. It's like, this makes no sense. And, and we cannot afford to spend and spend and spend more than we take in. Or maybe that's a safety net and an opportunity. I mean, if I ran a major investment bank and I knew I could take all the risks in the world and potentially blow the bank up because I know I'm too big to fail, well, then I am going to roll the dice and yeah, treat my no, bank like but, a casino. But no, but no executive is ever too big to fail. The executives lose their job. They lose their earnings. They lose what they've saved. Look, they... I'm pretty uh, sure the CEO of Silicon Valley Bank is still living large. I, I don't know where, the, where that particular CEO is. Hawaii. But I, but I, but I can tell you that people who are running various enterprises don't want to lose their enterprise. And they take risk when they think it's going to pay off, it's going to be successful. That's kind of, By the way, we could have a different economic system where there's no risk, all right, where no one goes bankrupt. It's communism or socialism. We don't want that. Our we system, want effective risk Our management. system is working, all right? I, it's not like it's not working, it's working. Now and then it makes a mistake, we got to make a correction. But the idea of having the federal government just hand out trillions of dollars to people is not something that's going to work for the American people. They're not happy about it, number one. And number two, we can't afford to keep printing money and handing it out. Ultimately, that means that our money will become worthless. That's the track that we're on. That's why, well, frankly, why both President Biden and President Trump have to be honest with people and say, we've got to reform our spending. We've got to reform our taxing, both. We're going to have to finally rein in the excesses of government and keep paying off people to vote for us. Well, there certainly are people around the country who agree with you. You were the last uh, Republican nominee, and many of your supporters feel a bit homeless. I mean, Nikki Haley just yesterday won 20% of the vote in Nebraska and Maryland, and she's been out of the race for 10 weeks. What does that say for this faction of your flavor of conservatism? Where do those voters go? Is this a moment? to create a MAGA movement for your wing of the party. Maybe it's actually happening. Yeah, my wing of the party is like a chicken wing, all right? It's a little tiny thing that doesn't take the bird off the ground. All right, so uh, we're going to have to change that, in my view. I don't know how that's going to play out over time, but there are going to be voices that come forward that I think will be uh, more aligned with the traditional uh, conservative views that, that I've espoused and that our party has traditionally. We'll see. Time will tell. I can't, I can't predict what's going to happen in politics. But, but the I, chicken wing needs a home now. Yeah, well, so it's, we, it's you've got a two-party system. Yeah, it's going to have to choose between the two candidates that are there, and it's going to do so very reluctantly. Why do I think people are not all getting behind, 100% behind Joe Biden or 100% behind Donald Trump? Because they're not entirely happy with the two. When you ask people, would you rather have Trump, Biden, or someone else, someone else typically gets the plurality, if not the majority. 
They'd like something else, but that's not the choice they have. And as a result, they're going to have to choose between the two. So what choice will you make? Yeah, I'm not announcing that here and now. I'm not going to be voting for, for President Trump. I made that clear. Uh, I know for some people, uh, a character is not, not the number one issue. It is for me. Uh, when someone has been, um, well, determined by a jury to have committed sexual assault, that's not someone who I want my kids and grandkids to see as president of the United States. In the last two elections, I believe you wrote in your wife's name. Shows a lot of support for her. I get that. Um, but that's not a serious thing to do. And you're a very serious person who's laid out all sorts of risks that we face. Do you see yourself writing in a candidate this time? Well, my particular vote doesn't have a big uh, impact because I'm from Utah and President Is that Trump what you win. say to voters Tr from President, Utah? No, no, what I tell people is that you ought to choose between one of two people. That people at large ought to choose between one of two. In my case, having been the former nominee of the Republican Party, I want to make sure that I am in a position after this election to have some influence on the direction of our party in the future. And so I'm not going to go out and do something which would make that more difficult to occur. I really think our party has to come back to the uh, uh, basis that has been successful for us in the past. What does that mean, you want to have some influence? What do you want to do? Not 100 percent sure. Uh, you know, there are all sorts of groups out there that are trying to get us back to the middle. Uh, there's a group that's saying, hey, we should have uh, ranked choice voting and should change the structure of primaries. That's an interesting idea. There are others like no labels and problem solvers and forward. They're all these Good different groups. Good at raising groups. money. Uh, well, and they're, they're trying to have an impact. They just haven't been able to in many cases. So I'll look at what they're doing. But I want to see if we can't get candidates to actually uh, tell us the truth and work towards the center. I mean, you've got both President Trump and President Biden saying, we won't touch entitlements. Look, mandatory spending, entitlements, is 72% of what the federal government spends. We cannot have a balanced budget. We cannot reduce the amount of debt we have that we're passing on to the next generation unless we're honest that we're going to have to adjust these programs, either by raising taxes to pay for them or reducing benefits or changing the, the retirement age. No one is going to change benefits for someone who's a current retiree or a near retiree. No one wants to do that. But we're going to have to honestly look at these programs and Frankly, bringing America together means being honest with the American people. So do you think the likes of a no labels suits you or do you see yourself starting a group, starting a movement? Yeah, I don't see a, a new party having uh, any prospect of making a difference. Uh, I would think these groups that are out there, were they to collaborate in some way, might be able to encourage candidates to move more towards the center, perhaps with their endorsement, their financial support. Um, uh, so I'll take a look at that, I imagine, after my Senate uh, term is over. But at this stage, I'm, uh, I'm focused on the Senate. Uh, there's talk today about a presidential debate, maybe as early as June. I know debates were important to you. They certainly got you a lot of momentum in 2012. Do you think they matter today? In many ways, we know a lot about the two people running. Do you think it will impact votes, maybe even your vote? Well, the image that comes to mind is those two old guys on the Muppets, you know, that sat in the balcony. Statler and Waldorf. <laughs> Statler yes. and Waldorf, all right. That, that's what comes to mind. But I actually think there will be a huge audience uh, for these debates. Uh, I think people have very low expectations as to what President Biden will do. I think they have much higher expectations about President Trump and his combativeness. What are your and, expectations? Uh, well, I, I share uh, the, the public perceptions. We'll see what happens. Now, I've interacted with President Biden and find that we've had good exchanges and he's capable um, uh, and I like the man. I, I know President Trump. I watch him in his rallies. He seems uh, energetic and, and uh, uh, forceful. But, you know, rallies are kind of easy. you got a cheering crowd and you got teleprompters you can read. So how will they do in person? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think America will be watching. You just said you like President Biden. You didn't say you like former President Trump. Oh, he, uh, President Trump is a, a riot to be around. He's a very funny person, a very engaging person. Uh, I, I can't say that I'm impressed with matters of character, particularly as it relates to his interactions with women. What does that say about this country, right? And I don't want you to get into criticism of President Trump. You've done it before, but you represent character. You represent integrity. If our country knowing what they know about Donald Trump, decides to elect him. What does it say about our national character? Well, I'm one of those that believes that character is the single most important thing in selecting the person to lead the nation, that we can survive bad policy, but that long-term 
we can't be the leader of the world if we're led with bad character. Some people disagree with me. They say, no, actually, policy is pretty darn important. What's happening at the border is important. What's happening on tax policy is important. What's happening on inflation is important. If families are having a hard time putting food on the table, they might think uh, character is all well and good, but I need to pay for my food. So people have different priorities, and, and I respect that. My priority is that uh, character comes first. Decency is everything. We're almost done. I, 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 and again, I don't want to get into the details of this criminal trial happening in New York, but there is one. And Donald Trump is the criminal defendant. 50 years ago, leaders in the Republican Party walked into the White House and told a criminal president he needed to step down. This week, leaders in the Republican Party went up to that trial, stood outside the courthouse, and attacked our legal system. How does that make you feel about Republicans right now? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a, a, a terrible fault for our country to see people attacking our legal system. That's an enormous mistake. Uh, I think it's also demeaning for people to quite apparently uh, try and run for vice president by donning the red tie and standing outside the courthouse. That, it's just, uh, I, I'd have felt awkward uh, were I one of those individuals. Um, but I, I can also say, I think President Biden made an enormous error. He should have fought like crazy to keep this prosecution from going forward. Uh, it was a win-win for Donald Trump. If Donald Trump is exonerated... Is that, Don, is that Joe Biden's job? Or is that the... It, let, shouldn't let there think, be a I separation? You, I, I've been around for a while. If LBJ had been president and he didn't want something like this to happen, he'd have been all over that prosecutor saying, you better not bring that forward or I'm going to drive you out of office. But I'm pretty sure you support having separate but equal branches of government. I do, but I also... Let me tell you, I mean, you may disagree with this, but... Uh, had I been President Biden, uh, when the Justice Department brought out indictments, I would have immediately uh, uh, pardoned him. I'd have pardoned President Trump. Uh, why? Well, because it makes me, President Biden, the big guy and the person I pardoned the little guy. And number two, uh, it's not going to get resolved before the election. It's not going to have an impact before the election. And frankly, the country doesn't want to have to go through prosecuting a former president. I think the American people have recognized that President Trump uh, did have an inappropriate affair with someone who was a, a porn star. I think they realized that. I think they realized he took classified documents he shouldn't have and didn't handle them properly. I think they understand that as well. I think they realize he's been lying about the election in 2020. They know those things. So these things are not changing the public attitude. And frankly, we ought to get beyond these and focus on the big issues that really matter to the American people. Our inflation, our border, what's happening around the world, America's involvement in the world. Uh, and, uh, and I think President Biden and President Trump would do best focusing on the future for this great country. Before we go, one of the most important things is our democracy. Democracy held in the last election in large part because your Republican colleagues followed the rule of law. If President Trump loses this election, are you concerned that your colleagues won't do the same this time and will have a different outcome? I, there's no question, but if this election is a narrow win for one side or the other, uh, the side that loses will say it was not a fair election. And I don't know how democracy works if people can't trust elections. And if they can't trust Can America's... you think of an example of a Democratic president who tried to hold up the certification of the newly elected Republican? Uh, you know, I, I'm not enough of an historian to be able to go back. I, do I know, know you know the I, answer I know, to that, no, but I know, no. No, no, I, I know the, but I know there were a number of senators and congresspeople that tried to hold up the certification of state electors in the past. So uh, that, that had happened before uh, it was uh, uh, squashed, and it was squashed in 2020. I presume that will be again. I hope so. Uh, our institutions held, but you can't be 100% confident that they'll hold again. Uh, look, there, there's no question, but that when you have a, a person running for president who uh, is not willing to say, I believe the outcome of an election, that's a threat to democracy. And when you weaken our judicial system, uh, when you we, uh, weaken uh, the FBI, uh, are, uh, these are things that, that strike at the heart of democracy, and that's one of the reasons we're fighting as hard as we are to shore up these institutions, tell people the truth about them, and hopefully uh, have folks listen to folks like you uh, to understand what's at stake. But still, sir, you are an optimist, and you believe in American exceptionalism. Mm. Why are you so optimistic about our future? I want to understand what is your message to America. This might be one of your last interviews. Well, it's not going to be my, seat. I was going to say, not In my last <laughs> uh, First of all, America is an extraordinarily resilient country and people. We have been through a lot 
world wars, the Cold War, Vietnam, pandemic, financial crisis, depression, and we come out the other side. We, we just had this, this uh, you know, extraordinary pandemic, and yet our economy is strong, low levels of unemployment, it's extraordinary. And, and is that because the, the president is pulling all the levers in the right way? No, it's not. It's because the American people are fulfilling their dreams. So the economy is strong. The, the, yes, the economy is strong. There's no question. The economy is doing, doing well. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's because of the American people. It's not because of the president or the Federal Reserve. They can mess things up. But, but the American people pursuing their dreams is what makes America work. Freedom is an extraordinary elixir. It's what allows us to outcompete the world. I mean, Europe is on their heels right now. China's on their heels right now economically. They're not gone by any means. But American freedom has worked, and it continues to work. That's what gives me confidence in the future. Uh, will we suffer slings and arrows? Yeah. Will we come out the other side? Absolutely. Senator, it was an honor and a privilege to speak to you this morning. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Stephanie.